Hi, uh, my name is Natalie Yeadon. I'm the um, Managing Director and Co-Owner for Impetus Digital. At Impetus Digital, we have collated and curated some of the best-in-class collaboration tools for advisory boards, virtual investigator meetings, any kinds of collaborations that are going on internally. We really believe at Impetus that everything starts with a question and then results come from courageous conversations. And we wanna be able to bridge that gap by having those kinds of um, conversations within our portal, utilizing our tools. Especially in these day, this day and age with a moratorium on travel and a lot of virtualization of meetings, we feel like we have a fantastic uh, opportunity and a platform at which to have these conversations. So with me today is the infamous Jeff, uh, Jen Horan, um, Horan Jeff, and she is the founder and CEO with Savvy Cooperative and has some really, really cool things that she does uh, with patients. And uh, today we're actually going to be talking to her, talking about digital, talking about the future, clinical trials and where patients are in general. And I wanna start off, first of all, asking Jen some questions about how she got into the space um, from the get-go. And I think she has a very interesting story that I think I'd like her to, to share with the group first. So Jen, tell us a little bit about um, you starting off as a chronic illness patient and kind of what brings you to the table and got you starting, starting this company in the first place. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on. Always a pleasure to chat about why patients are, are really important to think about and we create new innovations to make sure that we're creating truly inclusive innovations. And I care so much about this because I am somebody who considers themselves a patient first and foremost, most notably because I was diagnosed when I was an infant with juvenile idiopathic arthritis among several other autoimmune conditions. So I feel like I've kind of always been a patient. This has just been my way of life. I also had a brain tumor removed seven years mm. ago at this point. So I've always been on that side of the healthcare system. I wanted to then go and make an impact myself. I was originally pre-med, but truthfully, I saw all the inefficiencies that our healthcare system had and that my clinicians couldn't even practice the kind of medicine that they wanted to because of other sort of barriers in place. So I was a little disenchanted by uh, taking that route and instead became a human factors engineer and human-centered designer, specifically in healthcare, thinking how can we fit the world to people who have different needs and abilities and priorities, rather than just saying, figure it out, and unfortunately leaving a lot of people out. I went on to get my PhD in environmental medicine, mm. which sounds really loaded. Really, I was studying what are known as patient-centered outcomes and redoing clinical trial outcome measure sets and treatment guidelines to make sure that we're measuring things that matter to patients, not just clinicians and payers who also have their own priorities, which we need to take into account. But somewhere along the way, we've kind of never started to ask patients what they really needed. And so that was sort of my lens, was also an FDA advisor and still am to help them think about, you know, what is the patient perspective when they are reviewing different applications. And so I had a lot of different perspectives that ultimately led me to see this uh, problem across the ecosystem, that there were a lot of people that were trying to innovate and create new things that ultimately uh, are meant to benefit the patients, but they weren't actually talking to patients. And that was uh, something that didn't quite make sense to me if we wanted to make the most effective solutions. And so that's where Savvy was born out of. So maybe you can actually describe a little bit about what Savvy does. So when, and, and I'm also just curious about the inception or the original business model, and then based on what has happened in the marketplace, and I think certainly now after COVID-19, has there been any pivots, changes, modifications to the original business model? And can you share that with us? Yeah, so this is just something that I conceived of when I was being asked to do what Savvy became to be early on without any sort of formal company. And so that would be people saying, hey, we need access to patients now. We understand, we've been throwing around these buzzwords that patient centricity is what we all wanna be. So I guess we should talk to a patient. And because as I mentioned, I kind of already had a seat at the table of a lot of these conversations that when projects would come along, people would say, oh, Jen, you're a patient. Will you be that patient rep on this committee and that project? And at first I was flattered. But when people kept coming back to me, it really signaled a diversity issue. And I am white with a PhD in New York City. I cannot possibly speak to everybody who has the conditions that I have, 
uh, you know, I, I spoke for all people with arthritis. There are 54 million Americans with arthritis. Mine is just one perspective. And so I became uncomfortable at sort of being that spokesperson. And I started playing matchmaker just organically with my community. So, you know, someone would say, can you give feedback on this? I said, wait, let me go get you more input. And I would go to my communities that I was already a part of. And I was flooded by requests from those patients who wanted to contribute, but they just never knew anyone was asking. They didn't have a pathway to connect with these innovators and they wanted their voices to be heard. So that was the sort of aha moment of, okay, we can solve this. This is what technology is for. We need a platform that can create a marketplace between the two sides. So when those companies or innovators are looking for patient perspective, either through interviews, surveys, focus groups, user testing, design workshops, whatever that might be, they can post those needs to the platform and then patients can go and see the opportunities and opt in to participate. The other aspect is that we really advocate that those patients are fairly compensated for their time and expertise because it has value. And you know, clinicians, when they're asked to you know, participate in market research or things like this, they're being compensated. And if they're serving on something like a committee, while there might not be a direct monetary exchange for a clinician who's serving in that committee, there is some level of remuneration in the sense that it's helping their, their career and it's helping through, you know, get them to the next level. If I'm a patient and I work at TJ Maxx, and I have you know, multiple jobs and I'm a single parent, but you're asking me to take time off of work to go participate in things. If I'm not fairly compensated, it's really hard to engage. And so this is a diversity issue if we don't think about engaging patients fairly. So that's how Savvy started. And our model is a little different, but it relates exactly to what we do. We are actually incorporated as a cooperative which is a shared ownership structure. So we are collectively owned by patients. So that's different than like a 501c3 nonprofit, but it's different than your typical LLCs or C-Corps that people in the States are familiar with. And we really felt that that was the right model because we wanted patients to have a voice in our organization and have them equitably valued and share in our profits too, as we become more and more successful. So that's how Savvy started. And in terms of have we pivoted, uh, it's fascinating. I recently found some early like mock-ups of what Savvy was going to like be like on a website from four plus years ago. And the truth is we really haven't because this need is still here. So it's always been the same thing. How can we play matchmaker? In light of COVID-19, what we see in terms of changes are just different parts of the industry pivoting in different ways. Certainly in the anything clinical trial related, people are trying to understand how can they better outfit their trials to be run remotely. And so that requires patient input. Um, but beyond that, we're not really seeing much of a slowdown because hopefully people see that now more than ever, we need to get insights from patients to understand how do they feel about this new world we live in. So this really brings up some interesting questions, because let's really be frank, Jen. I mean, we've been hearing the words patient centricity for many, many years. And I'm actually just curious, because I, you know, before starting my own company, I was in pharma for 18 years before that. So patient centricity almost became a buzzword, and you kind of heard it over and over. But then again, there was almost like talking from two sides of the mouth. Have you seen an evolution and a maturity of actual patient centricity or do you find that it's still kind of a buzzword and people are kind of playing on the periphery and not really understanding how to include patients as part of the pharma or the medical device or the life sciences business model? Absolutely. I do not think that we are fully there yet. I, I kind of gave about a decade of permission of people spouting around these words, and now it's time to act. And that's, a, that's all that Savvy's trying to do is solve that one piece of the puzzle. So if you say, oh gosh, well, we don't know where to find these patients, we go, aha, we've solved that part for you. And so that's what we're trying to bring the two sides at least closer. I think different... <laughs> different industries are doing a little bit better, but also you just see the differences between companies. So take like Big Pharma, for example, we work in this space and I can tell you, uh, you know, I tell people like when I'm speaking at conferences, I'll come talk to you, me afterwards and I'll tell you kind of where on the spectrum your company lies because we just interact with these companies. And, and many the challenges, many um, individuals at a company want to be that champion but it's sort of this whole cultural buy-in and to make sure you can get management and other people to buy into the same ideas. So I truly believe there are champions within all of these companies, 
but it's just how can we get them over the finish line? So that's what Savvy's trying to do a lot more of between case studies and other materials. Last year, we put out a white paper looking at patient engagement in the life sciences where uh, people across the industry told us how, how their companies were handling this. Some saying, gosh, you know, we have to put it on our website, not because we feel like we've really done it, but if we don't say it, then people will think that we aren't. But that's kind of like nullified it, that it's now not really meaningful to anybody because everybody says it. So there's no level of prestige to say that. And so we, we're seeing a shift, but I can't say that everyone has the same level of buy-in at this point. Well, I know that we're kind of going through the whole COVID-19, and I think certainly there's not a panic, but there's an urgency associated, especially around clinical trials. There's a lot of money that's in that, um, a lot of discussion around, okay, now we can't do in-person visits. How are we going to leverage wearables? Do we need to change endpoints? Do we need to go to IRBs? Um, you know, all those sorts of things. So have you seen, you know, a sur like a surge of requests and questions and interest as it relates to that early onset, sort of at the very early part of the brand commercialization, clinical trials. Are you seeing an increased usage of patients there? Right now, I think people are starting to think about it. I feel like we've seen all of this stuff kind of roll out in waves. At first, people needed to just kind of like, you know, put on their own mask and just make sure that they're okay. And then they needed to kind of just like get a hang of it. And now we're starting to see people go, okay, this isn't going away. So we truly do have to figure out how to make accommodations. And, and that is the interesting thing, right? Patients want clinical trials to continue as well. They need these therapeutics or other types of treatments to come to market because many of them are out of options or never had options in the first place, if you think about the various rare communities. And so they want to work with innovators to try to figure this out. They don't want it to just be scrapped altogether. But you mentioned a lot of things, wearables, you know, it could be nurse services. What does it look like? And honestly, this is what we see regardless of clinical trials, but people just come up with a new idea and they think, oh, patients are going to love it. Absolutely. And they don't even check. And then that's when things fail and we're wasting all this time and money. And we know with clinical trials that any amendment that has to happen along the way can really cost us a lot of time and money to stop everything and change it all over again. And so that's what we're just saying. Look, if we're kind of in this weird lull right now, it's a perfect time to stop and make sure that you're having patient input on protocol review. What does that look like? What's the feasibility of it now? Are patients comfortable with it? Can they do it? What kind of other support services do they need? All this technology that we throw at them. Gosh, I can't tell you how many apps that I'm just like, this is making the patient's life more challenging because it doesn't integrate with all the other things, the other wearables, whatever it is. And so we can't just slap more stuff at them and then call them non-compliant when it's not their fault. We just haven't figured out how this can all work seamlessly together. So I really think that there's a great opportunity for people innovating to think about that. And on the commercial side, once these things are starting to come to market, we do need to think about a better strategy for really communicating these things based on the patient's needs. And so I think we're going to see a big shift even in commercialization and how people interact with the world. I was thinking about that the other day, you know, gone are the days that we may be advertising at bus stops or things like this because there are people congregating there. So I think there will be a lot of differences that we'll need to be thinking about and patient input should always be core to that. You spoke about something very interesting there. And one of the pieces I think that we really have to reconsider in the business paradigm that pharma lives in today is this kind of um, almost siloed thinking of brand development within a silo, within this confines of a company brand or concept. And what you're really talking about is interoperability. You're talking about a seamless interface or a seamless opportunity or experience on the patient level. So is this wearable integrating? Is this actually speaking to my disease? Do you have any suggestions or thoughts? I mean, this again is part of that concept of impetus believes in the courageous conversation is, is this a bigger conversation? Are people in these siloed companies coming together to say, we need to rethink um, how we're defining this disease. We need to rework. We need to redefine what competition means. Or do you think we're just not there yet? Do I think we're there yet? I don't think we're there yet 
quite yet. However, hopefully a uh, un unfortunate but good uh, outcome of all of what's happening with the pandemic is seeing that collaboration is going to get us places faster. And so hopefully that will allow people to come together to think about best practices, to you know, talk about how things can be more interoperable. I really hope that we can get there because it's really doing everybody a disservice, not just the patients, but the innovators. And people are, you know, pulling their hair out because they can't get access to some other API or whatever that would allow them to do this more seamlessly. And I've been in healthcare, like I say, my entire life, but certainly all of my professional life. And I see this across the board, not just with for-profit companies, but also with nonprofits that sometimes it feels like we're losing sight of why we're all here, that it mm -hmm. is for the patients. And if that is truly your guiding star and you are so patient-centered, we have to think about, okay, everybody has a bottom line, got to pay the bills. I get that. But like, how can we reconcile that with what is actually best for getting treatments to market faster, for finding out what matters to patients? You mentioned endpoints. So endpoints and outcomes are certainly one of my favorite conversations because it can't just be a bunch of people in a lab talking about what they are interested in seeing. We really need to understand what does that mean for patients because otherwise we've seen trials fail because they just picked the wrong endpoint. And so that does nobody any service. The patients could have loved the medication when they were you know, in that clinical trial, but it never comes to market because they just didn't do that work up front. And that's a huge failure. Yeah, absolutely. It's very interesting. Speaking to the patients that you have, I'm just curious if anything is bubbling to the top of being some of the key concepts, needs, things that they were on their wish lists that are not currently being navigated, mined, provided by the healthcare industry. What are we not listening to right now when it comes to patients? How much time do we have? <laughs> this is a big topic, I see. Where, where, where should I begin? <laughs> oh gosh, I mean, so much is bubbling up. Um, even we, we started a, a new, we're calling it a vodcast, where every week I'm interviewing <laughs> different patients from different therapeutic areas and bringing them together. And it's fascinating, even for me, who's been working with patients across all different therapeutic areas. But like really digging in and understanding how this pandemic is affecting people differently with mental health conditions, for physical conditions, heart disease, lupus, when we're taking their medications for, for treatments. And it's just, there's so much to think about. I think one of the big takeaways that we're hearing now, because we work so much with chronic and terminally ill patients, that, you know, those are the high risk individuals. And there's a lot we can learn from them because they in many ways have been living the quarantine life for a long time because they needed to, to just make sure that they can take care of themselves when they're immunocompromised or you know, other risk factors. So why aren't we leveraging them more? People are saying, you know, we're here, listen to us because we can help. I think another thing that we're seeing now in light of all of this is that all these, it can't be done. We now see it can be done if we actually have the right pressures put on and it shouldn't take a pandemic to understand how can we scale telemedicine? How can we you know, have accommodations that could allow people to work from home? Uh, various other things that the communities have been talking about for a long time, but it was like, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. So how can we start thinking about these aspects? One thing that came up in a conversation recently that I found fascinating was around mental health. And how can we think about mental health as just as big as a need as physical health? When I was talking to an advocate um, living with bipolar disorder, saying they've shut down all the mental health clinics, but because people don't think about it, and this, they can keep open dialysis because those individuals, we can kind of understand they need that to stay alive, but we don't treat mental health the same way. And so what kind of you know, things can we put in place because remote uh, mental health treatment doesn't work for everybody. So if, if we're not living those experiences, we wouldn't have thought of those things. And I can't say I think of all of them because I'm not living with those conditions. So I think there's a lot of things that are sort of bubbling up of saying, okay, all this is well and good, but we're still missing the mark. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that's also interesting that you brought up is some of the pushback. And even though I don't think some people within the um, the pharma or the, the life sciences business model are aware of it, but there's almost like a like an infrastructure that almost wards off doing some of this work with patients. It's either policy or it's 
it's kind of the fallback of we just can't do that or it's not compliant. What are some of those barriers do you think that have been built up that you think are not really real or they are, they are surmountable? What are some of those things that you've seen? Well, I, I respect that there certainly are guardrails that we need to be very thoughtful of. They're there for a reason to make sure that everyone's acting accordingly and we're not duping patients into doing things. However, I do believe that a lot of this are perceived barriers. And that's why I said there's just sort of this spectrum, especially in the life, life science community, where there are those that we kind of consider that are innovation forward and like more innovation proof because they are so afraid to step out of bounds. Whereas others are like, we think we can do this. And if we can't, somebody will tell us. Um, not to say those individuals are reckless, but especially when it comes to patient engagement. People still believe that talking to a patient and asking them about their condition, what are their unmet needs? What are those experiences like? Is somehow going to get them slapped on the wrist when that's not direct to consumer marketing or off-label marketing. That's actually just like caring about a patient's experience. And the FDA says we need to have more patient engagement. The 21st Century Cures Act is telling us that we need to do this kind of work. The challenge is, is that the FDA stopped short of actually giving any guidelines or recommendations of how one does that. And so that leaves a lot of room for people to fill in the blanks however they want to. And so that's what's unfortunate is because there are those that are saying, oh gosh, until we're told you can do exactly this, but you can't do that, then they're afraid to test the waters. But that's why I think hopefully as we're showing more and more case studies of all the pharma clients that we and you know, other people are working with, and this can be done and it's important work and it's helping their you know, development process go even faster. So that's what we hope we can start to see. I, I understand why there are certain regulations there and we need to be really thoughtful about it. Uh, you know, one thing's around paying patients. And this is one of my favorite conversations because people go, oh gosh, we can't do that. Then it's going to bias them or whatever. But let's be very, very clear. These patients would be making what is known as fair market value. You're not going to do an hour long interview with somebody just like this and pay them, you know, $3,000 for that. But it's, you know, finding whatever is that sort of equitable way of accounting for their time, T paying for travel expenses so they can attend a meeting. That's just making sure they can actually attend the meeting. That should not be something that is um, debated in a way. But those, I think, are where people go, oh, gosh, how can we do this? And I just want to make it clear that we're not talking about excessive amounts of money that is bias anybody. It's just nominally making sure that we are covering their time so we can get those diverse perspectives so that they can attend, they can travel, they can take a, you know, a day off of work to participate. So those are the things we really need to bring up. And, and I think everybody is supportive of that. But until those companies have the exact guardrails, some of them are very fearful. And how are we going to get to those exact guardrails, Jen? I mean, are people, so for example, Impetus is loving, and when we talk about provocative, beyond the pill conversations, beyond brand discussions, these are the kinds of discussions and courageous conversations we want to have is how do we build those guardrails? How do we create those position statements using our portal, having virtual conversations, um, using asynchronous tools? Um, what is your view? Is there people working on this right now? And how, how can you, how can I get involved in, in the development of that? I mean, it's interesting to think about, you know, how can we make very established guardrails? I'm not sure that I want them. And that's what, you know, that's my innovation side showing that we don't always want to know where we can't go in the future. We need to understand that things evolve and what things look like in February are very different than what they look like now. And so we need to be able to do that. So I don't want to cap what we can't do, but I do think having clear boundaries of, you know, the obvious things, like I say, not doing off-label marketing or things that we know are no-nos, but trying to just be able to show examples. Um, if other people are like myself that really learn from seeing how others have done things, I think the more we can get out in front of this, the, the easier it will be for other companies to see. And kind of coming back to one of your previous questions and notes that you had made around how can we be working together? Are, is it, are these things competitive or not? I find that a lot of these individual companies are not wanting to be public about certain things, but I think it's doing the industry a disservice. If you are working with patients, 
why would you not want to go out there and show that you are actually doing the work? So that's why we're very excited that we're going to be putting out many more case studies with our clients to say like, tell the world, like this is a great thing that you're actually doing the work. And so we're hoping that more people will kind of come public with a lot of these things and some do, but if we have more of that to point to examples, it doesn't mean that that's you know, now the only ways that one could engage with patients, but at least it can kind of help some of those other companies and those champions within those companies go to their management or whomever and say, look, so-and-so did this. Don't you think now we could take our next step forward? How are patients getting attracted to, um, to your company? How are they, how are they finding, um, you know, you, you know, and what kinds of patients, I mean, obviously, you know, life science companies are going to want to find out, like, if I came to you, who's going to be in your database? How do I leverage it? So how are patients getting attracted to you? So Savvy has a very unique model because of our cooperative structure, whereas, you know, a lot of like recruitment firms or whatnot, they might have like a stagnant patient panel, but ours is ever growing and we shift based on the client needs. And so that's why when people say, well, how many, you know, X patients do you have in this condition? We don't operate like that because we really, what we do is we activate our co-op network and they go into their closed communities and pull new people in. So for example, we actually do really, really well in rare disease. We might not have anybody that we are currently in touch with, but because one of our members has a similar type condition or they know somebody else they are they unable to go and get access to that community. And I also want to note that we do this in culturally sensitive ways because we care so much about diversity and inclusion. It's not right for a kind of like a company to go knocking on that Facebook group and saying, hey, you know, give me your people or going into, you know, a community of color that has been disenfranchised because of other reasons and saying, oh, just trust me. So we need to be able to make sure that this is done in a way that's sensitive. So we have this peer to peer outreach model and it creates a lot of brand trust. And so that's why we're able to recruit faster. We're able to find more quality and verified participants, more diverse participants to really make sure that we're finding exactly the right kind of patients at the right time. So that's how a lot of patients find out of us. Last year, we had about 70% of the people who uh, did, we call them gigs, who did the gigs that we did. They applied through a, a, you know, a referral from somebody else. So that 70% were pulled in and had never known of Savvy before. So that's how we have kind of this model that makes our you know, scale quite considerably because we really wanna make sure that it's not the same people like myself talking over and over and over again. We can still get more and more people. Very cool. And if, for example, a pharma company, they've got a specific hematology project, um, they want to tap in, send something out, uh, you know, get set up for an advisory board. Um, how do they actually approach you? Do you send them the emails on their behalf so they never actually own any emails or information? How does that work once people opt in and then they're now part of their board or their program or their patient support program? What's, where's the ownership of the patient life? And that's a great question. We work very closely with our clients to figure out exactly what their needs are. So that's a, in a couple different layers. First of all, to find out what exact type of patient do they want? We get really in the weeds about what are the inclusion exclusion criteria so that we can go find the exact right patients. So we figure out that so we can identify who those individuals are. In terms of you know, do they have access to any of the patient information? What's the relationship look like? That can actually be different based on the needs of different clients. Sometimes they're deploying a survey and they don't want any contact information. Sometimes they're doing in-depth interviews like this, but they don't want any of that information either. And in which case we're handling all the patients, we're doing the scheduling, we're getting them online. So they never have to know anything beyond say a first name so they can have a conversation. But we're very sensitive to the fact that there are times that people don't want any PHI, in which case we take on all of that. We can consent the patients and send out any sort of forms, any confidentiality agreements, whatever it might be. So we really take on sort of that relationship management role in terms of you know if somebody is trying to convene an advisory board, same sort of thing. We can handle taking on the relationship. And we also have different tools and technologies to help facilitate all of that, especially in this virtual world. We do a lot more now around sort of allowing the, the industry or whomever the innovator to 
get access to the patients, but we can really say, well, here's how you can do it. And here's the different touch points you'll have. And we can take care of everything with the patients. We pay them so that the patient doesn't have to go knocking on a pharma company's door and saying, hey, it's been 61 days. We pay patients immediately so that the patient doesn't have to wait for that slow uh, process. We take on all of that up front so that it's all about protecting the patient in the end. Beautiful. And there's also potential great partnerships with companies like mine and with you and being able to manage, you know, asynchronous, synchronous, you know, constant touch points and opportunities again, because of the, 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 the um, issues around private information, et cetera. So very, very interesting. So kind of moving over to more of your innovations or your systems innovations thinking, and just want to quickly pivot there is, um, wanting to talk a few minutes about ownership of data and privacy mm -hmm. and those sorts of things and looking into the new world, looking into new technologies like blockchain. So right now when patients are part of clinical studies and clinical trials or other sorts of things, their data is being leveraged technically speaking for free. And so is there a conversation or is there an opportunity where using you know new things like blockchain where people were eventually own their own data and be able to monetize it do you see a future in that where people will be able to basically make a living and be able to just like for example youtube videos every time somebody looks at your video or something you get this like little incremental like almost like a cryptocurrency or you get this little you know ping and you know into your bank account is that something that you think is interesting or is an opportunity Absolutely. And I think that there will be very different monetization strategies going forward. This whole world is now data driven and it feels really extractive to see that all these innovations can happen on the backs of unfortunate experiences of patients and we don't reward them in any way. And I think that that's something that is interesting and perhaps a little bit more unique in the healthcare ecosystem than other, other industries that are more consumer focused. But if you think about what we're actually working with in healthcare is somebody ends up with probably a pretty crummy diagnosis and they, we kind of strip them of their agency and a lot of you know, other ways that they don't have consumer choice like other industries do. And yet we're still asking so much of them by having them share their data and people will do it of, oh, well, you know, it needs to be altruistic because there, it's a good thing. We're going to go innovate a new drug for you. Yeah, that drug's coming out in 15 years. So it's nice to say that that is, you know, an altruistic aspect. And that's, you know, still a lot of motivation for individuals. But it doesn't take away the fact that it actually has value. And that's what, why we became a cooperative, because it was uncomfortable for me to think about creating a profitable business that is built on patients doing the work since they're the ones providing the insight. And so I think it's just time to take a little bit of a pause and realize that it doesn't say that the other stuff that's happening doesn't have value, but that patient data does indeed have value. And I, I don't actually know what the winning technology is going to be, whether it's blockchain or something else um, to, to make that happen. But I do believe that that is the future that we will be able to incentivize individuals for sharing their data. And I totally agree, Jen. I mean, I think of the world, if you follow, you know, the Peter Diamandis's of the world and the Ray Kurzweil's, we talk about exponential technology and sort of the new invent of you know, digital therapeutics. At the end of the day, we're talking about a dematerialization and a democratization and a demonetization of things. This is going to be, we're accelerating very quickly into this world. And so we're, we're kind of unifying the opportunity. It's almost like the new UBI or universal basic income is people can leverage their data sets. I mean, you know, I wear an aura ring or there's Fitbit and these, these da our data is being collected and leveraged and sold. And I think people need to take back ownership of their data and start to make some money on it. So I think it's an interesting, uh, courageous conversation to have. So I'm also just kind of curious as well too around, um, you know, the, the, you know, when we start talking about this in the development of real world evidence as it relates to sensors and things, do you see a world or a future where patients could potentially create their own clinical studies, where they'll use their wearables, they'll do crowdfunding, you know, crowdsourcing for funding, they'll raise their own clinical trials and bring their own cohorts together and actually pull out the, the, the middlemen, so the IDNs and the CROs and potentially the manufacturers. Is that even a topic of discussion? 
Oh, yes. It's a topic of discussion, um, one that I've had a lot recently. And, um, you know, I don't think that's changing overnight, but I'm, I'm happy to hear that that's at least on your radar, too, that there is collective bargaining that can happen when the people who have what one needs, their bodies, their data, et cetera, come together. You can be really powerful with what that looks like. So it doesn't mean that it's going to change overnight because certainly it's developing out actual therapeutics. We need lab space. We need all of these kind of things to make that kind of work happen. So I, I believe it's going to look more like a partnership level going forward. Um, and there may be distributed ownership within it because of that. But, you know, those with money do not, will not be the only ones that have a say and can make decisions in this. I think as patients can come together, they will have more of a voice and more ownership, or at least that is my hope, so that collectively we can work together and make all of this happen faster. And wouldn't that be lovely that, you know, investors or whomever else can go make their money, but also we can reward those individuals who are also so integral to part of that innovation. Another part of the equation on the, the whole payment piece is about insurance, health insurance. What's your thoughts about the idea of patients creating their own insurance cloisters? So now that data is free, it's available on dashboards everywhere we go. You find people with similar disease areas, similar health parameters or you know health metrics. You bring people together and they consider themselves lower risk. And so they create their own insurance cloisters. I mean, is there, is there discussions on that? Or but what's your thoughts of the future about people creating their own insurance groups and kind of removing, if you will, the third party health insurance or the payers around that? Well, there are a lot of people working on different sort of insurance models, or at least thinking about what does it look like if the insurance industry as we know it no longer looks like that. And, you know, we see things like direct to primary care and, and all of that. And that's very different than what you're proposing. But I think that it's ripe for having these conversations. There have been uh, cooperatives around health, health insurance cooperatives as well, where there's a different level of buy-in and ownership. Um, but in terms of patients coming together to use their data to somehow gain, uh, you know, enough sort of protection should anything go wrong, It'll be really interesting to see. I don't know what the answer is going to look like, but that's what we know about, uh, you know, when people come together, either in co-ops or in unions or whatever it might be, there's collective bargaining power. And so when you have, you know, a group of individuals that are engaged and have thoughtful, you know, requests, so you, you can start to make things happen when we can at least, you know, use a collective voice. And so it will be quite interesting. I don't know what the answer will be, but, Hey, I think what we've learned, and I'm glad you didn't ask me what's my uh, cure for the health insurance market here in the U.S. I do not have an answer, but I know that this isn't working, especially now we're seeing when insurance is tied to employment and you have unemployment rates like we do now. This is not a system that works for people uh, when they need it most. And so I think we really seriously have to think about that. And I hope that that is one of the conversations that we'll be having as we build a new world after the pandemic. Totally agree. And I think another really interesting discussion, and I'd love to get your take on this, is really around bioethics and data privacy. I guess one of the questions that I oftentimes ask is, is there such thing as privacy? What does it mean to own versus share? What should be shareable? What should be ownable? Um, and all of the myriad of like, you know, the avalanche around that topic. And I think what's really important around that is um, it's really this question. I mean, we're seeing it all the time. I mean, there's, you know, GPS following of where, you know, where's the COVID-19 cluster that's happening to, you know, general surveillance and sort of the social rating systems that are going on in China. I mean, this is the new norm and it's happening faster and it's accelerating. So any thoughts around the data privacy conversation? I mean, it's, that's a whole conversation to have, and it's a really, really important one. And you know, I think we are seeing in, in light of a crisis, some people are willing to, you know, relax some of their privacy concerns in order to move things forward. I do think that some of that will, you know, sort of rebound back to where we were when we realized that, again, data has value. And sometimes it's, you know, for the good of curing a global pandemic. And sometimes it's for the profit of a company that is then going to go 
sell their data to another and make a lot of money. We're seeing that a lot in as there are more like M&As happening within the healthcare industry that a patient or a consumer could have signed up for one various platform or thing that was collecting their data. And then, oops, now that gets sold. Either the data gets sold or the company gets sold and the patient didn't consent to that secondary use, but now they, they have no agency. So when you talk about how can we share that data, it's hard to consent for something you had no idea was gonna happen. And so how can patients have the ability to turn uh, these kind of things on and off? And I'm glad that you delineated the difference between sharing and access with ownership. A lot of people love to throw out the term ownership and perhaps because I, you know, run a cooperative, I am like a stickler for no, that's not ownership. And so when people say, oh, it's like having ownership, I'm like, yeah, but it's not actual ownership. And so if you wanna give ownership to patients, that means that they should have control, they should be able to share in profits. Um, so they need to be able to make those decisions. If it's sharing, I think that's also important and there'll be a time and a place for that. But again, at least I can say, I want you to share it with that research institution, but not that for-profit company, depending on what their needs or desires or that individual's own values might be. So I think that that's important. The other aspect of this is that we do know that data now can be de-identified and that's a concern. And so I don't have an answer for it, but I think we, before we just start going out and saying, oh, but that's fine because it's all de-identified, we ha I don't have a lot of data to show us that that in fact is not always the case, that it can be re-identified. And that has a lot of implications. I can tell you on a personal level, there are many things that even though I'm very innovation forward, I have not chose to do because I am afraid of health insurance. Because if you know certain things are you know, known, and of course I'm, I'm pretty much an open book, but what does that mean for my access to care? So that is my number one concern. Otherwise, I'd share all my data, but if it means that somebody can discriminate against me in the future, and that's what a lot of patients with chronic illness are thinking, my gosh, like, how much do I disclose, you know, even from a, what is my employment status going to look like if, you know, certain people know, but all the way to, okay, well, now I, I just am no longer eligible for the benefits and health insurance that I had. So it's not, it's not an easy conversation to have with those that are really struggling with what is the worst case scenario for them? Yeah, totally love it. We, we've talked a lot about different things, positive, whatever, you could call it positive, you may actually have a, a different view on, on disruption in healthcare. We talked about potentially replacing CROs, IDNs, insurance, manufacturers, but here's the ultimate question. At some point in the clinical trial development or in the development of innovations, is there gonna be a potential replacement of patients? As we talk about things like trials in silica or you know the utilization of quantum computers like IBM Watson and kind of whirring away with machine learning and developing these algorithms and matrices and things are we going to be developing products without even using humans is is this something that's ever come up in in your discussions well i think there are certain use cases for that that will be applicable However, the problem with only using existed, existing data sets to learn from is that there's so much bias already in those data sets. And so we will only learn from what's in there. And I'm going mm -hmm. to overgeneralize, but where so many of our clinical trials are conducted in white men, that's not going to tell us a lot. And we've seen even recently things come out of how insurance companies were handling data and that uh, you know, treatment recommendations look different for different segments of the population. And that's completely inappropriate. And so that's what happens when we use the existing data because we have a lot of bias that's built in and we, we're going to need to do a lot to go out and collect new data sets. So I do think there is a time and a place for it. Obviously we want to you know, put human beings in as little risk as possible and the FDA would certainly advocate for that as well. Let's not do another trial on people if we can avoid it. But until we get the data that we need to make this fair and inclusive so that innovations help everybody, not just a subset of the population that happen to be easier to engage, then we really need to still think about how are we going to create trials or other innovations with those individuals so we can get them enrolled, learn from them, and create more equitable solutions. I love it. We've talked about so many outstanding things today. Honestly, I could talk to you all day. You're just like a wealth of information. No wonder you... Uh 
uh, you're a faculty member at Columbia, so good for you. I'm sure people love listening to your ideas and thoughts. Um, we, you know, this is just a very interesting world. And, you know, we've talked about, you know, the interest around diversity. We've talked about the interest around sharing and this whole new world. If you were to just sort of, sort of summarize, you know, as my last question here, of what would be your greatest hope in this sort of new world that we're living or emerging or kind of incubating in this sort of self regulate you know, the self quarantine, and we're now emerging from this gestation period, what would be your greatest hope for what the next phase of, of this looks like for you, for your company, for patients? I mean, my biggest hope is that patients are no longer looked at lesser on the totem pole that they are equals, but they just have a different area of expertise, of lived experiences that can't be learned in a book or a webinar. And that should move us forward and allowing them to have you know, an equal seat at the table, both from how they're engaged, how they're compensated, how they're looked at. Uh, you know, that's what I find even in the committees that I sit on, that although I have a PhD because I'm sitting there as a patient representative, immediately your IQ is knocked down certain points. It's just the way it is. Everybody else will be, uh, you know, addressed as doctor so-and-so, but not for those patients. And I have no issue, but I don't want to be called doctor, but I think it's just coming back to, we don't think of them as having any level of intellect at the same um, you know, plain as other experts. So that's the biggest takeaway, because if we can look at them as resources uh, that are not extracted from, but looked at equitably, then we can actually create all of these different things in an ecosystem that addresses each of the different stakeholders' concerns. But if we only ever bring together individuals like payers, providers, employers, innovators, to then figure out, oh, how can we go help these lowly little patients that's never going to come up with the best solutions. So my hope is that we can all come together on a level playing field. Love it. I really appreciate this conversation today. Um, again, at Impetus Digital, we believe in these courageous conversations. Everything starts with a thought and into a conversation, and that's actually how change happens. And we, we do this with our asynchronous and synchronous tools and love speaking to people like yourself and many other innovation, innovative thinkers because these are the crystallizations and the opportunities for positive healthcare disruption. So where can people find you, Jen, if they wanna, wanna find out more about you? Well, they can certainly visit Savvy's website. Uh, and I must clarify how Savvy is spelled. I can't tell you how many people misspell Savvy. It is S-A-V-V-Y dot co-op dot C-O-O-P. Um, so there you'll find lots of information on us. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram, Savvy underscore co-op. Myself, uh, please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or Twitter at Jay Hor and Jeff, and happy to connect and always wanting to nerd out about patient insights and cooperative models. Thank you so much. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for having me.